Hello everyone, this is Jimmy and welcome to episode 31 of FTB Interactions. Today was going to be Blood Magic Day, but maybe that I have to be put off for a couple reasons. Let's see if we get around to it later in the day. Anyways, first things first, I want to check on the status of our Grains of Infinity farm here. And it seems to be working great. Our output chest is basically full. In fact, it was full earlier and I cleared a few slots out of it. So I need to do something about this. I'll probably just store all these into more caches or something. I don't know. Um, and we have a lot of grains of infinity. Cool. However, if you look on our mini map, there's a lot of yellow dots down there. And I think those are referring to all the bats down here. Um, yeah, we're leaky mobs, and apparently I fixed the problem where we were leaky mobs upwards, now we're leaky mobs downwards. So I think I just have to uh, figure out what chunk this is in, and make the floor here double thick. That should be an easy fix. However, in more pressing news, I appear to be out of oil. Uh, in fact, I think I caught this at just the right time. I'm out of oil in my tank, but I still have oil in my system, so everything hasn't shut down yet. Now, I do have a backup plan in case everything shuts down, and that is I have uh, one tungsten steel cell full of nitro diesel as my backup plan. Basically, if everything shuts down, I can cold boot with this. Actually, on second thought, if this is what I'm going to use to cold boot the system, I probably shouldn't store it in digital storage, huh? That'll make it very difficult to get it out to cold boot with. So it'll sit in there. If everything shuts down, I can still use that to load up my generators manually and get everything turned back on. Because if, uh, if I run out of fuel, that causes the generators to become starved. That causes fuel processing to stop. And, you know, chicken or egg. Well, I have at least an egg in storage in case I mess everything up. Anyways, let's start by moving our pump to solve the immediate problem, but it seems that that pump is only lasting a couple of days. So let's uh, also try to come up with a better long-term solution. Oh, this oil vein is indeed all mined up. All right, well, let's go to the next one, I guess. Let the oil flow once again. I just have to configure my conduits. So this will take care of us for the immediate future, but again, we need... Something better than to move our oil pump every... I think it's been two days of server uptime between uh, when I last moved it and now. So every two days seems like a not great solution. We have options galore when it comes to how to get oil. First option is the Neuromantic Prime system from Astral Sorcery. This just pulls resources out of the... basically out of the void. And there's a lot of oil is specifically configured in this pack for the Neuromantic Prime to pull. The veins are large, but not infinite, and the Neuromantic Prime is a little on the slow side. It also requires a lot of crafting. You need one of those, one of those, at least one of these. It's a big multi-block, takes up a lot of space, but it's very good. Second option, we can distill heavy oil into light oil one-to-one, -one. And heavy oil can be produced every 16 logs produces 200 millibuckets of it. So every stack of logs produces 800 millibuckets. Needs a fair bit of fuel, uses a fair bit of energy, but it's an option. Third option, we can electrolyze oil sands. This gets us a bucket of oil per oil sands dust. However, oil sands dust, I think we need asteroid mining missions for. And perhaps a bigger deal is that oil sands dust doesn't have a 64x processing line. So I think I'm going to pass on that one. The, what are we on? Number four. The fourth option is a centrifuge soul sand for oil at 100 millibuckets per soul sand piece. And you get the convenient byproduct of a little bit of saltpeter dust. Uh, I don't know how much saltpeter I might necessarily need. However, historically I have needed saltpeter and it's been non-trivial. Well, I guess that's for erythium. We will never need that again. I don't know, maybe we'll need it again at some point. But uh, that's an option. And oil, there's, soul sand can be produced from hellish matter or transmuting nether wart blocks, but nether wart blocks take too much nether wart. So um, yeah, centrifuging soul sand, or centrifuging hellish matter gets you soul sand at a not terribly great rate. So we between these options, I don't know what I'm going to pick. Let me think on it for a moment. 
Well, I think the Astral Sorcery one is definitely the coolest option. The tree option being 100% renewable, I think pushes it over the edge for me. So I'll go with this. It'll involve a tree farm that'll just be a tree beacon with some starlight shining on it because we have to produce 16 logs per 14 seconds if we run our oven at HV, which is probably enough, although I might overclock it to EV, so then we need to produce 16 logs per, what, like, six-ish seconds? That's definitely going to require starlight shining on a tree beacon. Um, and then a pyrolyzed oven, a distillery to turn it into regular oil, and that's it. There's a bit of a question about what tree to grow, but I'm going to go with silverwood because uh, I mean, the wood is just useful in other ways, right? So let's grow some of these trees. It also helps to have a larger tree, I believe. Having more wood pieces just results in uh, having the tree beacon producing more wood. So if these trees could grow, maybe they're too close to each other. Looks like two trees is enough to make it so that the tree beacon won't accept another tree. If I grow a third one, it doesn't turn all ghosty because it exceeds a maximum number of blocks that the tree beacon can work on at a time. So looking at this, you can see that the tree beacon actually, uh, oh, first of all, it, it drops the blocks around itself, not around the trees. So I get to put it a little bit further away and uh, it still functions. So anyways, this actually produces blocks at a pretty high rate, even without starlight shining on it. But I think we do need more than this. Additionally, I've let it run a little while and I don't see any saplings. Maybe with silverwood trees it only produces logs? I know saplings are a very rare drop from silverwood leaves, so maybe it just we haven't gotten one yet. I don't know, I guess we'll find out soon enough. Anyways, collect the wood. And yeah, indeed, only wood so far. Anyways, I'm probably going to just cannibalize this starlight collector thing because when we did our test right we saw that its net increase on the total uh starlight output is like 10 percent so that's so trivial that i don't care for it i think i've shown the effect of starlight on a tree beacon before but uh it's pretty remarkable it's rain and wood <laughs> yeah okay that's way more than 16 pieces per 10 seconds or 14 seconds whatever we needed that's not really 16 pieces of wood per second huh and it looks like it does indeed drop silverwood saplings and quicksilver drops these are i mean they're not useless they're used to make the coalesce in the diffusion core so i guess that's fine let's store it all in a just a barrel because barrels are voided and no matter what storage system i use i'm going to have to void excess this is a lot of wood all right, next step then is to turn this wood into actual oil. The pyrolyze oven is like a, I guess you would call it a sideways blast furnace. The blast furnace that it's tipped over and it uses UOV machine holes in, or UOV machine casings. I, casings? Holes? One or the other, I'm not sure. Um, in place of the heat proof blocks. Besides that, it's basically, I mean, it's the same shape as a blast furnace, except sideways. And our pyrolyze oven is built, so it does use ULV machine casings, not hulls. I'm supplying wood into it with through the input bus with a program circuit. An interface here is just stock to keep wood in it. The input bus automatically pulls out of it. As for the outputs, one of the outputs is ash or something, something useless. And I just uh, I just void that. Let's see, what is it actually? Yeah, ashes. I think there's something you can do with ashes. You can centrifuge them into carbon dust. Meh. I throw it out. Anyways, um, the actual product that comes out here is heavy oil. I distill that into regular oil. And this is, you know, what we do all this for. So I just need some way to get this oil into, I guess, this tank. Right? Because I'm, yeah, I'm directly pulling from... Actually, it's you that use it. I'm directly pulling from the tank with a conduit. Um, I do have a fluid storage bus here. I guess I can just use a fluid input bus. I, I have my network set up in a way that that could potentially break things. But 
No, I, I think it'll be fine. Basically, I have a bunch of fluid storage buses set up around the network that I intend to use for extract only. Um, and it would be bad if uh, the wrong fluid gets inserted into there. But what I can do is I can set you to 1001, which I know is the highest priority on my network. And therefore, oh, but then if this tank fills up, uh, uh, I think all my fluid storage buses are partitioned. I'm going to trust that all my fluid storage buses are partitioned, and I'm just going to put a fluid input bus on this. And just like that, our oil is fully renewable. Aha! Rewinding back to the start of the episode, our module storage here is not going to empty itself, so I already have it set up to trash useless things like this, but why don't we take everything else and put it into a ME chest to uh to for storage purposes so i'll put it i don't know let's go with here and into the chest you have to put a storage cell so while this storage is technically non-infinite it's i mean it's a lot of items so it should be it'll be completely fine another advantage of the emmy chest is that in addition to holding a tremendous item tremendous number of items we can view these items from our me network uh if we're connected to it obviously without the use of a storage bus so let's take a look at, I don't know, grains, I guess. You can see all those grains of infinity that are here. It saves you a storage bus, I guess. With our problems from the start of the episode fixed, let's check up on our Terra Shatterer here. Based on the fact that the mana pool wasn't draining, I suspect it's done. Let's see. Aha! Double S rank. Get a life. Yeah, well, you're not wrong. Anyways, let's also enchant it. Uh, can it be enchanted directly? It can. Alright, I just want unbreaking, I guess. Yeah, good enough. Um, I'm not going to be using it for anything that requires fortune. I guess magnetic would have been nice. Anyways, let's also put... Uh, well, no, that's all I need. I do need some mana in my inventory, though. So let's get my tablet. And, oh, it's already loaded up with mana. And let's go mining. Let's try it out. Um, I'm gonna go do it in the end because I'm out of tungsten. Yeah, I only have tungsten dust. So let's go to the end and mine a tungsten vein. I guess I have to find a tungsten vein. Here's one right up against the surface. So are we ready? I have... Do I have to activate this somehow? Here, let's just break a block and see what happens. I do. Uh, what's the hotkey to activate it? There we go. Just shift right click to toggle it on or off. And now, <laughs> it mines a massive area. Um, it takes mana to do so in place of durability. So you can see each time I mine, it takes a significant chunk of my mana, actually. But uh, yeah, it's a good pickaxe. I guess I should put fortune on it when I hit things that are incidentally affected by fortune. I believe you're allowed to use it without mana too, it just costs durability. Um, but seeing as how I have unbreaking 20 billion on it, and I can just repair it with a... I guess I have to put... Oh no, I have my repair talisman. I can just repair it with my repair talisman. So it's probably better to... Or at least it's easier to use it without mana. It's still perfectly effective. Um, but also seems when digging down you only go two layers at a time. Oh well. Anyways, uh, there's a vein of something down here, and I want to get it. Uh, molybdenum. Cool. Well, that was a fun little side expedition. Downside is repairing this is going to take a little bit of time. At one point a second, that's what, 800 points, or uh, about 15 minutes? Oh well, I guess I have to hold it and a repair talisman in my inventory for about 15 minutes to patch it up. Well, that tongue state and chi light I dug up, I may as well process now. So, uh, I guess I need something to feed this interface too, because it only holds nine stacks. By the way, nine stacks of ore processes into, remember, like literally a million pieces of dust. Now that we're halfway through the episode, let's get around to doing the thing I said I would do at the start. And that is automate the production of these demonic will crystals, but not just the normal type. We need all the various types. Well, I guess in this case we just need destructive, but we may as I mean if you're gonna make destructive, you may as well make all the will types. So there are five of them. There's normal demon will, and then corrosive, destructive, vengeful, and steadfast. To make them, I need tier two rituals. 
Right now I only have the tier 1 Ritual Diviner, so to upgrade this we're going to need tier 4 runes, right? These are demonic slates, which are, yeah, tier 4 runes. So let's upgrade our altar to tier 4, and maybe in the process I'll put some actual functional runes on it. Who would have thought that'd be a thing, right? The altar caps for tier 4 altars are skystone blocks. We have about a bajillion of these. So those are... Just drop them in. As for the runes, I have some efficiency on orb runes I looted from dungeons. So let's put those in at first. Uh, they don't exactly do anything. At least, they don't do anything meaningful. But, um... I mean, they fill in the slots, and we have a lot of slots to fill in. Uh, and then I'll fill in the rest with blank runes, and then we can look into upgrading them. The rune I want most, really, is Rune of Sacrifice. However, Runes of Sacrifice require Will Crystals first, so... Uh, yeah, that's not happening. And this should do it. I was able to get our Ultra up to Tier 4, at least I think so. Let's get our Sigil to check. While I was doing this, I also realized I don't know what an efficiency rune actually does. I've never actually used one, I think. I thought it was one of the blood pumping runes, but it isn't. Where's my seer sigil? Here it is. So hopefully this says tier 4. Uh oh, still tier 3. Um, What's wrong with this? Are one of my things at the wrong height? No. Oh, wait, no, that's right. These are, huh, altar, what's wrong? I think there's a book I can use to check. Not a book, an altar diviner. This will tell us, I guess, what's wrong with our altar. And divine the altar. No? Some of the altar is obstructed. Gee, thanks. That's a helpful message. I'm 75% sure that my caps here are just one block too high. So I'm going to bring them all down a block and see if that fixes it. And indeed, we now have a tier 4 altar. Because there are runes of the orb on this altar, my blood orb gets to hold a little bit more LP, so it's filling again. Um, I posit that the message of some of the altar is obstructed is not a very hopeful message. Apparently some of the altar is still obstructed though, so thank you, altar diviner. Anyways, efficiency runes. They don't even have a recipe, so I guess they're loot only. And apparently what they do is when you don't have blood in your altar, the crafting normally progresses backwards. Efficiency runes make them progress backwards more slowly. Um, yeah, they're basically useless. Now that we have a tier 4 altar, we should be able to upgrade an imbued slate into a whatever the next tier slate is. Uh, it's going to take a lot of LP. Go faster, you. There we go. Man, I really need real runes in this altar, so I don't need to time in a bottle my Bob Agonizer just to craft. Thankfully, the quest for one demonic slate rewards a handful more. Uh, apparently there's a ritual diviner quest. Oh, that gives us an altar diviner. Well, I crafted one of those earlier. Anyways, um, now that we have this, we should be able to upgrade our ritual diviner to the next tier. Sometimes items don't like shift clicking in. There we go. So now we have the Dusk Ritual Diviner. This can do the tier 2 rituals. There is technically a... Uh, oopsies, wrong search box. There's technically a third tier Ritual Diviner, but I, I don't think it does anything. There is... no. There's no rituals by default that require the Dawn Diviner, so unless like a, a pack custom adds them, there isn't anything. And because there's no recipe for the diviner, I'm going to assume that this pack doesn't use it. All right, so now that we have the dust diviner, we just need a bunch of ritual stones and we can do our rituals. In total, we need about a hundred maybe? Um, there's, let me figure out what rituals we have to do first, I guess. The first step involves three different rituals. So that means we will need three Master Ritual Stones, and I didn't count exactly how many Ritual Stones they need total, but it is in the ballpark of 100. So let's see about making uh, those Ritual Stones. I think it's yeah, it's one Reinforced state, Slate per Ritual Stone, and the Master Ritual Stone takes four. Alright, so I need about 
just short of two stacks, I guess, of reinforced slates. Um, yeah, I guess let's get on it. To make this process a little bit faster, I should at least automate the crafting of blank slates. This is Life Essence, Arcane Stone, and Nocturnal Powder. Nocturnal Powder, unfortunately, can never be fully automated because it has to be made in a luminous crafting table, but I have uh, a lot. Yeah, I have 850 from dungeons, I believe. So that just means I need to automate the creation of Arcane Stone, which I guess requires the automation of Knacker Blocks. I kind of wonder, so the dungeons, there are Thomcraft themed dungeons, I wonder if they have Arcane Stone in them. Let's go take a look. Um, if I recall, they're on Euclides. So let's teleport to Euclides, find a dungeon and see it, what the walls are made of. Doesn't look like we're gonna find any. I think this is one of those dungeons. It's marked. They, you can tell because they have these like Thompcraft uh, loot crates in them. And when you break these open, you get some useless things that clutter your inventory. But um, and there's like these greater crimson portals that summon mobs out of them. They make it very difficult to get around. Unfortunately, there is no Thompcraft blocks actually. So that's a shame. I guess you can steal the banners. A further perusal of the configuration files for this pack reveals that uh, Thomcraft, uh, Thomcraft dungeons are actually overworld dungeons, so they're not in the places I was looking for them, but they don't contain a arcane stone anyways, so we have to craft this. Alright, so how do we craft it? Takes knacker blocks and any vis crystal. Knacker is basically knacker fluid and some things that are free, so we have to fully on well we should fully automate the production of this fluid. Before that though, maybe we should properly automate the production of mana. Right now I've been making mana in a light well by melting these mana enriched eggs, which has the advantage of being free. It has a disadvantage of being exceptionally slow. So other ways of making mana include in a mixer, although this requires automating niter first, or by just turning some of our Batania mana into um, wizardry mana. And because Batania mana is so easy to come by, right? we have boatloads of it here, let's just do that. So let's set up a system that'll take some of our Batania mana and turn it into wizardry mana. I need a bit more Thaumium, but now that we have access to Thaumatoriums and easily transfer to Sentia, we can craft it much more easily. I don't have to uh, throw items into cauldrons anymore, or crucibles, whatever. I can just put a Thaumatorium here, I'll pull Essentia out of our Essentia provider, at least so long as we have the right types. Uh, I guess we still do the little lines have just stopped. We're almost out of Precantatio, the little magic purple wand right above my cursor, um, so let's get a bit more of that. I seem to recall Aquamarine was my preferred source of it. Uh, I'm a little low on Aquamarine. How did I make this? Oh, just from Sapphires? Okay. Anyways, Aquamarine, get melted. And that should turn into plenty of Precantatio. And this gives us a lot of Thaumium. The purpose of the Mana Extrapolator here is to either turn Batania Mana into Wizardry Mana, or vice versa. And in this case, I want this process, right? Batania Mana into Wizardry Mana. That means you need to have a Batania Mana input hatch and a Fluid output hatch. If you want it the other way around, you just reverse the hatches. You want a Fluid input hatch and a Mana output hatch. Anyways, the only way to check if it's working is to actually uh, come down here and right-click the controller. And it apparently thinks it's working, but I don't think... Is it actually doing anything? No, right? Yeah, there's nothing in either hatch. Uh, which actually makes me wonder... Well, I guess it thinks it's doing this, except it's not. I don't know, let's see what happens when we blast it with some mana. So I am giving it mana, you see mana is entering the mana input hatch. Controller is doing something, couldn't tell you what it's doing, but you know what? let me give you, let me give it the blueprint in case it matters. But last I checked, there is... No fluid coming out. Ha. Huh. I elected to not put the optional 
parts of the multi-block in. On the other side, I could have put a mana input and a fluid input. Uh, or fluid, hold on. On top of the mana input hatch, which is on the left side, is yeah the fluid output as expected. So I could put a mana out. Take me back to the first floor. Uh, oh, well, I guess the mana hatch is full. Yeah, I could put a Batania mana output hatch on the bottom and a fluid input hatch on top. Let's do that and see if that makes this thing work. Well, when I put these hatches in, the mana started sending again. So something's happening. And there we go. It did produce mana. So I guess it only makes mana if you have all the hatches. So even though these appear to be optional, they're not. Um, next thing seems to be... Oh no, never mind. I was about to say it seems to uh, continue to consume botanium mana even when the hatch is full. But no, I think that's just because it can, it can produce this mana exceptionally quickly. All right. So with that in mind... Um, let's actually make a couple changes here. I, right now I'm pulling mana from all the mana pools, but it's causing all of our petrol petunias to turn on. Petrol petunias to turn on. And I think they... Uh, maybe that doesn't matter. They might run less efficiently if they're outputting at partial power. But no, I tested that before, right? And it, it doesn't matter. Never mind. Um, so I, I don't need to change that. Uh, in any event, I just need to take this mana now and connect it up to my ME system somehow. Where do I have a line running? I guess I can run it off this line here. I'll connect this up with a fluid storage bus set to 999 priority. I want it to consume the 100% free mana that comes from our chickens before we use this almost 100% free mana because it's, I mean, it's slightly less free than the chicken mana is, I guess. I take back what I said earlier about powering all eight being okay. How do I describe this? The way a petrol petunia works is that every second or so, if its internal buffer is not full, it will consume one second's worth of burn time on the bucket of fuel it has consumed. And if that brings the bucket, you know, its internal fuel, which isn't shown, to zero, it sucks up a new bucket of fuel. However, um, it consumes that full one second worth of fuel, regardless of if it's just barely empty. Like if it's, you know, in this state where, where it's only used up a tiny little sliver of mana, or if it's, its internal mana buffer is a lot more empty. So because I was just barely skimming off the top of all eight flowers at once, I was causing all eight of them to effectively burn fuel at 100% burn rate. Um, now that I switched to just one flower, I'm causing one flower to run at 100% burn rate. And one flower at 100% burn rate is about what one spreader can do anyways. So by doing so, I've reduced the, uh, I've basically reduced the fuel wastage, I guess. Um, it's a little convoluted, but that's the way it is. Anyways, uh, we have a full tank of mana now. Mana is still blasting away because the mana, um, I can't select the thing behind it, the spreader. But the mana hatch has a massive internal buffer of approximately one mana pool. To turn the mana into knacker, I'm going to use a series of formation planes here. Well, formation and annihilation planes. So mana goes into this drum. This formation plane will place it in world. And this annihilation plane is filtered because the only storage bus it's, it's connected to says only store knacker so that tank is empty now what happens is that fluid will wait there until a gold nugget gets dropped in it of course in the long term this gold nugget will be dropped in automatically but for now i'll do it by hand go it does its little animation thing and turns the fluid into knacker which then gets automatically picked up i have a sensor here to detect um, the number of entities. I want to detect... Actually, I can, I can just do fluid, can't I? Yeah, I can detect if mana is present in the block, and if so, I will have it drop... Let's see. I will have it drop um, the, the gold nugget. 
And here's the final solution with the dropper and the controls. So the controls essentially are, if the output tank is not full, I have the threshold set to a redstone of 14 out of 15, so that's somewhere in like the 63-ish bucket range, If it has, or maybe 60-ish maybe buckets. If it has less than 60 buckets and there are no entities detected, that is there are no gold nuggets detected there, then it'll send an output this is just a AND gate, if, or a, I guess it's a NOR gate. It's an A NOR C gate. It'll send a red zone signal that'll cause the precision dropper to throw items. And because of the length of the pulses, I guess it, the dropper is a little bit fast, so it drops two items before the scanner realizes there's items and turns it off again. Oh well. It means that, well, that time it only dropped one. It means that from time to time, our precision dropper here might waste, you know, a nugget. If it drops two nuggets, but we don't pick up the second bucket of knacker within, or we don't, we don't pick up, I guess, the first bucket of knacker within five minutes. Um, meh. If it despawns a gold nugget from time to time, whatever. Anyways, this steel drum contains that, so let's put a storage bus on it. Fluid storage bus. And we're... We've got Knacker fully automated. So let's partition it, and we're good to go. Two mixers later, one to mix Knacker, and one to mix in Life Essence, we should be able to request blank slates. Let's go with, I don't know, 100? Yep, I have it set to use this any available Vis Crystal. I honestly don't care what it chooses, and apparently this is a set that it's choosing this time. All right, so should see these machines kick on, and haha! Uh, I just forgot to set auto output on this one. But with that, we are now auto. Well, we can on-demand craft at least blank slates. Now we still have to turn them into reinforced slates. For the time being, I'll just craft these by hand. We need to have a bit more blood generation before we can really auto craft with slates meaningfully. I mean, right now, any slates we craft also take like five minutes each oopsies i want to accelerate you but uh yeah after we get some good runes on our altar i'll i'll start looking at auto crafting um slates remember how like five minutes ago i was trash talking these efficiency runes calling them literally useless turns out i have enough efficiency runes that i'd actually get zero backwards crafting progress so uh I guess I could just jam stuff in here and let it craft at its own rate. At least for recipes with only 5 LP a tick consumption. I think as consumption goes up, I may eventually reach a point where I have like 1 LP a tick backwards progress. But right now it rounds to zero. So you know what, efficiency runes? I apologize for calling you useless. You're not useless. With some generous time in a bottle usage, I've now crafted... 100 reinforced slates. So let's turn these into those um, ritual stones that we need. I think I need our blood orb as well, which is... Where'd I put it? Put it in our storage system, apparently. Alright, so... Uh... Uh oh. Oh, I have it set to there. Okay. There's 40. What did I run out of? Obsidian. Oh. Sure. Our little obsidian box. Give me obsidian. Ooh, I guess that's all my EMC. <laughs> um, I have plenty of obsidian sitting in a. Uh... Oh, there we go. I have plenty of obsidian sitting in by my caches over on the space station. I guess I just never hooked that up to my E system. All right. Anyways, I am in range, right? Yeah. So make sure I'm not using infinity energy here. So let's make three master ritual stones as well. I wish the A system would automatically grab the appropriate life or blood orb, but alas. And then we can start setting up our rituals. No, there's one more thing we need, and that's a weak activation crystal. This is used to uh, actually begin the to make the rituals function. Now we have all our components to begin this process. First of all, the entire system we built here has to fit within one chunk, because Demonic Will is a chunk-based resource. So let's use this chunk here, because nothing else is using it. Start, you place 
one ritual stone at the bottom. Set your ritual diviner to... Um, you want the ritual of peaceful souls. This just summons mobs and uh, they act... Oopsies, I just clicked past it. All right, time to go all the way around. But they act as uh, sacrificial fodder to power this thing. This ritual takes 12 runes, which you can see when you mouse over it. And just begin right click. I thought it was just right. Oh, there's a torch in the way. There we go. Right click on the master ritual stone and it forms. Now you can activate it by clicking it with a weak activation crystal, but it actually summons mobs. So let me build a small wall around this chunk to keep the mobs from escaping. With a containment wall built, let's activate the ritual. Activate the ritual. There we go. So that takes a little bit of LP out of your network, and I believe while it's running, it continues to drain your uh, your essence just a little bit. Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't. Well, hold on. Yeah, it has summoned one mob, and it doesn't appear to have drained my... Oh no, there it goes. Yeah, it drains about a thousand LP per mob summoned. So something to keep in mind, while, while you're running these rituals, you need either a large LP buffer or you need to keep your life orb in your blood altar. Neither of which I'm doing right now. So by putting my life orb in there, it will automatically fill up. And it should fill, hopefully it fills fast enough anyways, that uh, I don't end up losing LP overall. Anyways, um, unfortunately this does summon flying mobs from time to time, which means that uh, they can escape. It also summons stuff like squid, although apparently squid don't suffocate. Interesting. Anyways, um, Squid, get off that. Oh, don't blind me. That's just the first um, ritual we have to do. Next, we need the ritual of forgotten or gathering of the forsaken souls. This takes 44 runes and it has to be placed a little bit above our first ritual. So let's go up a handful of blocks. I don't know exactly how many. Four or five is probably a fair number. Place another ritual stone, get rid of that filler there, and turn this into an actual, you know, just basically right click it again and let it fill in its box. What this ritual does after you activate it by right clicking it is that it damages all the entities down here and it makes them very sad. In fact, it even kills them eventually. Womp womp. But what happens is when those ritual or when those entities die, it helps, uh, this ritual helps accelerate the growth of will crystals. However, it doesn't grow the crystals on their own. To do that, we need another ritual. That one is the resonance of the faceted crystal. So let me set my ritual diviner to that. It's a little difficult to tab through this because, well, you can only go forward. So if you pass it, you have to go all the way around. And I don't have a good idea of how close I am relative to the one I want. Also, I think I misspoke earlier. The resonance of the faceted crystal doesn't um, doesn't grow crystals either. It causes crystals to become other types of crystals. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Anyways, build it with a one air gap one air block gap between the two master ritual stones, and activate this as well. Now we're going to need these two blocks that we used before, the Demon Crucible and our Demon Crystallizer. Let's take these both over back to here. You want to place your Demon Crystallizer, I believe, directly above this Master Ritual Stone. And then take your Demon Crucible, you can place this anywhere, uh, as long as it's in the chunk. So let me see, what side do I have? I have a one block, here we go. That's not in, or that is in the chunk, but not in the wall. And you have to supply that with some demonic will. So my Tartaric gems are all empty. I think I have a gem in here that's not quite empty yet. There's a little bit of will in it. It's probably not enough, but we'll, we'll use this will to get started. When you place a Tartaric gem in a demon crucible, it releases the, the uh, will that's inside into the chunk in the form of the demonic will aura and in fact i did make a it will no i didn't make a will gauge i can make a will gauge though because i have some will crystals let me make a will gauge and i'll show you what i mean uh just kidding 
I had to make a will gauge, I need demonic will, and I just drained all of my demonic will, well, almost all of my demonic will into the chunk. So that's not gonna work. Anyways, what you see here is that over time, this um, demonic will a uh, demonic will cluster will form on top of your demon catalyzer, and every time it reaches full size, it splits, giving off uh, one of each of these other demon will crystal clusters. These are what we're after. Once we let this split enough times, um, we can take down the topmost ritual. But first, we have to let this run long enough to get at least four of each de demonic will crystal cluster. Each time this center demonic will grows, it consumes some of the demonic will from the chunk, and it's up to our tartaric gem to refill it. However, at some point our tartaric gem here has run out, so that's not happening anymore. What we can do is we can take some of these will crystals that we've gotten from quests and crafted before and put them in the demon crucible, and it will burn it'll burn these up. Much like it burned up the will that was in our tartaric gem. I think it's something like 25 or maybe 50 per will crystal, I don't know the exact number, but that'll allow this growth to continue yet again. If you want this process to go faster, I found the most efficient block to time accelerate is actually the ritual stone that's summoning mobs. By accelerating that, you cause more mobs to spawn, which causes this process, I think, to be more efficient or something. I don't know the exact interaction, but uh, spawning more mobs means you have more mobs to die, which means this runs faster. Anyways, if we get one more spire on each of these rituals or on these uh, will clusters, that'll be as big as they get. And we're there. Now that our wills are fully grown, this top ritual, which I believe was the residence of the faceted crystal, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's done its job. We don't need it anymore. So we can break these, and when you break them, you get seven demon will crystals. So break that, and each of these give whoopsies will crystals of their respective type. So now we have all the different types of crystals. Next, we can take down this ritual. So get a ritual dismantler. Uh, actually, I think the fact that because I broke this one crystal, it, the ritual dismantler won't work. Uh, I think the ritual dismantler only works on activated crystals. A ritual. So let's activate it once again. Whoopsies. That that last rune I just placed has to be colored. So paint it for me. All right. And then activate it. And then you shift right click to dismantle it. We need yet another ritual now. This time it's the crack of the fractured crystal. This ritual will harvest our um, will crystals in the future. If you notice, when I harvested these, I broke them completely, and thus there's no, there's nothing left to grow. What this ritual will do is, when it harvests them, it'll leave the center of the the spire intact, so that there is, you know, the so that the crystal can keep growing. So let's build this ritual out. Am I out of ritual stones? Uh, it appears I am. Let me make a few more. Got an additional 32 ritual stones. Hopefully that'll be enough. I guess we are four short. Anyways, make an... Oh, I guess I can't activate this ritual because I don't have enough LP in my life network. Yeah, I only have 5,000. All right, let's turn some of these rituals I have off. Almost all rituals can be turned off by just applying a redstone signal to their master ritual stone block. So I'll apply a redstone signal there and one here. And that should turn both of these off. As you can tell, they're no longer getting dinged for... Uh, for taking damage and they're no longer spawning. I don't know exactly how much LP it takes to start this ritual, but 50,000 tends to be enough. So, yep, there we go. Now it's started. Of course, we're not using it for anything yet, so I'll turn it off as well so that our network can continue to regenerate. Apparently that took somewhere around 25,000. Then we have to turn our will crystals into will clusters. These are the placeable version Whereas if I try to take one of these will crystals, I can't actually place them anywhere. I can use them in crafting, but I need to place one in order to get them to start growing. So, uh, let's craft them. However, doing so requires a rather high amount of will. Um, in fact, it takes minimum of 1,200. And I don't think our Tartaric Gem goes that high. We only have a common. Common only goes up to, yeah, 1,000. So we actually have to upgrade our gem. What does this take? I think the next is a greater Tartaric gem. 
Where are you? That's common. Greater. Here we are. A greater gem takes a will crystal, a demonic slate, a common gem. That's all fine. But a weak blood shard. So to make the weak blood shard, we need a bound blade. And to make a bound blade, we need a binding region and a diamond sword. And a binding region is very easy. All right, so I need to fill my gem up to 400. There's actually a kind of trick to this. Let me show you. If you put your Tartaric gem in a Hellfire Forge, in a chunk where there is um, Will in the aura, it'll pull it out of the, like Will in the chunk, it'll pull Will out of the chunk back into the gem. Now, to put more Will in the chunk, we just have to take some of these extra Demon Will crystals we have, which we have 56 of, and melt them in our Demon Crucible. So put those in there, and that'll fill our gem for us. It's a little bit easier than going out there and smacking mobs. Now that I have Will in my gem again, it's also a good enough opportunity to make that aura gauge to show you what I mean about how to check the amount of aura in the chunk. So the chunk I'm currently in, uh, I guess it doesn't even need to be in your hand. It just needs to be in your inventory. It's currently empty. If you look at the upper left, if I hold shift, it, hold, it displays numbers, a bunch of zeros. This chunk, however, uh, I guess it's, yeah, about, it shouldn't be a bunch of zeros. It has 89 of normal will. The other four are these four types. I don't know what order they're in, but there's none of those in it. I can melt these will crystals to put that type of will in there, but I'm not ready to do that quite yet. Let's make our bound blade. So it's binding reagent and a diamond sword. This isn't a regular diamond sword. I don't know if it'll work, but it appears to be working just fine. Shift right click with their bound blade to activate it, to turn it into an actual sword. Hold it in your main hand and I think you can kill stuff with their bow in your off hand. And your kills now have a chance to drop. Uh, maybe they have to be actually killed by the sword, I'm not sure. But they have a chance to drop demon will crystals. Let me kill a few more mobs this way to see if this works. Yeah, it works, and I, I meant to say chance to drop weak blood shards. So we need a handful of these. I'm going to go around killing mobs for a bit. I suspect if I put um, fortune on my sword, I'll get them more, but I didn't do that. In fact, they're actually a pretty rare drop. I'm going to head back and put fortune on the sword. It'll definitely help. By fortune, I definitely mean looting. So, uh... There we go. It's enchanted. The rest of the enchants don't really matter. I mean, I guess since it has sharpness and hell infusion on it, maybe it one-shots pigment. I guess we can find out. It indeed does one-shot pigment. Aha. And uh, it, we probably average more than one blood shard per, per kill now. So, yeah, now they're super easy to collect. And it looks like, yeah, it's fortune level, or it's looting level does apply to bow kills when I have it in my main hand. I need a second common gem because I need one common gem to power the crafting and one common gem to actually upgrade. And then I can upgrade it with a demonic slate. One slate and, uh oh, what was the last item? A will crystal, right? There we go. And now this will become a greater gem which holds way more will. I can drain the will out of one gem into the other by just right-clicking it, put the greater gem in here, um, let it get up to 1200, or yeah, 1200-ish. I need a bit more than 1200, right? But then I can craft these. There we go. And I'll do this for all four will types. Our Gathering of the Forsaken Souls ritual, this top one here, will also accelerate growth of all of these crystal types. However, it doesn't accelerate growth of the crystals if we were to place them on this level. I don't know why. Um, it just doesn't look for crystals on that level. So you have to make sure you place them one level up. So I guess if I... Well, here, let's place them two levels up. Like this. Uh, which one goes? I guess it doesn't matter. Do they grow on that? They do. Um, that way I can actually access the uh, the lever there if I want to turn this system off in the future because it's say it's draining all of my LP so that's well it doesn't really matter what you plant where you have five total crystals they go in five total places 
All right, and then let's turn our rituals back on so that they start growing again. As I've said before, however, the crystals don't grow on their own. To, to make them grow, you need to put you need to put will in the chunk, and right now this chunk is empty. To put will in the chunk, we need demon crucibles. And because now we have five different types of will, we need five demon crucibles. So one for each. And then you just have to pipe your will crystals in one each. So I'll probably put each on a different channel. One on brown, one on blue, yada yada yada. Now when I come back into this chunk, you see that there are there's all different types of will present in the chunk. And those numbers are slowly ticking down. Those numbers tick down as these will crystals absorb it. And then once it falls below, I think it's 50, a new piece of will is burned to uh, to cause more, you know, to, to refill the chunk. Um, oh, and especially in the case of normal will, I have to take my gem out of here so that my gem isn't stealing all the all the will. In fact, my gem may have already stolen all of it. It's okay. It's uh, you can just put your gem in here and have it return the will to the chunk. Anyways, pretty soon these should split, or these should grow, and when they grow, they should split afterwards. Let me make sure I have my rituals all turned on. Uh, this one is still off, right? Yeah. Basic, uh, I, lever off is ritual on. Could be a little confusing. Anyways, all all the levers should be off now. As you can see, these uh, will crystals are now flying off. Of course, we don't want them to just sit around, so I should come up with a way to automatically feed them back into here. Putting in the item route in here is the last step. So all the drops get collected into this chest here by an item collector. From there, they get distributed into either, if they're a will crystal, they get distributed into the appropriate barrel. If it's anything else, it gets put into this ME chest. And these are just like the mob drops. Um, I don't know how much of this will be useful, but like ink sacks, this is my only source of black dye right now. So it eh, doesn't hurt to have, right? Then what happens is after they get put into these barrels, they go back into the crucibles, get melted, turned into aura, then the aura gets turned into crystals, and the loop continues, ideally producing a net positive. And we can already observe we have more crystals than we started with, so indeed it does produce a net positive. Alright, now that we have these crystals, oh, we've gone a long way, we can use them to make void metal. So let's make a piece of void seed or some a few pieces of void seed and then some void metal. I have four void seeds. I need 16 destructive will crystals. Let's see. I need to make sure not to take all of them because if you take all your crystals, you're liable to uh, make your to accidentally stop your process. But with 16 of these, so the void seeds and what fluid do we need to make void metal? Liquid nightmares. That's what our farm here has been doing. I think I recently stopped, yeah, I stopped solidifying it to start gathering it in a tank here. And uh, apparently it's, wait, why did this turn off? Oh, I see what's happening. I Because I stopped solidifying um, the, the crystals, I also uh, stopped providing infinity dust to this mechanical user. Now the mechanical user will also take dust out of the cache. And the system will start back up. All right, whatever. I needed 16 buckets of liquid nightmares, and I have it. So let me transport that somehow. The fluid tank from Ender.io is conveniently exactly 16 buckets. There's also the volumetric flasks, which can you can make basically any size you like. All right, so is this the blast furnace that's not doing anything? Yeah. Let's put our fluid in there, um, and our items in here. Ah, and we're off to the races. Void metal is being made. One more trip through the blast furnace, this time void metal and dark matter, with the fluid being life essence, should make, oh, why isn't it working? Red matter. Um, ah, it's an ivy recipe. All right, it's easy enough to fix. These blast furnaces have a convenient extra slot not in use in the bottom here. So I can turn this casing into another energy input. 
All right, now why are you still not working? IV 4500. Less than 4500 IV. Board metal, dark matter. Oh, it's because I have, okay. Um, Greg Tech Machines, if you have fluid in their hatch, or if you have inputs in the hatch when you form the multi-block, yeah, it's, if you have a full valid recipe in the hatches when you form the multi-block, it doesn't recognize it. You just have to take something out and put it back in. There we go. So here comes red matter. We only need one piece of red matter because if you remember, the reward for the red matter quest is more red matter. So that should be in our ME system. Oh, here it is. Red matter. Quest complete. Ooh, two quests complete. Anyways, claim that. Get four more red matter. And with that, I think we can make our Aurelia artifact. 12 different inputs. Well, 13 if you count the uh, cores far. Click start. How long will this take? The better part of forever. Um, 12 million RF? I think right now I'm limited by... Yeah, let's get a better Spectre Coil here. Well, this will only help a little bit. Man, it'll still take forever. All right, well, I'll be back in like five minutes when this is done. Upgrading the capacitor in our power buffer should help. With a silver capacitor, we only get 2,500 RF attack. Yeah, with an Octadec, we get up to 25 or 22,500 RF attack out. Um, I guess at this point, our limit is the energy conduit, but I think we're already almost there. Uh, I'll put the recipes in for better energy conduits. Whatever. In that time, our artifact is done! We can now travel to Aurelia. That's our quest reward. Oh, just a trophy. Alright, well, you know what? This trophy is significant enough. Let's place it right here. Mm, August 21st. While our artifact was crafting, I also checked how much I had recorded for this episode. And apparently I'm almost at the hour mark, so uh, this is going to be a very long episode. We'll uh, call it a, a double header for no good reason. Anyways, to use this artifact we need to go to our space station, but we also need our rocket on our space station to uh, be able to actually head down to the planet. So right now our rocket is on Euclides, and it's kind of floating in the air. So let's see about getting it back. It's just chilling here. Honestly, the easiest way to get it back is probably to disassemble it and carry it back in pieces. Brought it piecemeal back to our void world where we can turn it back into a rocket. In fact, before I do that, let's put the chip in there because I think you never crash if you put your chip in your guidance computer before you turn it into a rocket, but you sometimes do if you do it afterwards. Also, I think every time I've rebuilt my rocket, it's been slightly different layout because I don't remember how I built it the previous time. All right, so uh, once it gets fueled, I assume it's fueling. Yep, we can launch it up to our space station and then we can warp our space station to Aurelia. I wonder if we'll land on anything important in our space station. I hope we don't break something by landing on it. It's almost like I planned to have the rocket land here. What a perfect landing spot. Anyways, now that we have, uh, now that we're on our spaceship with our rocket, we can tell it where to go. So we want to go to the other system. Uh, there's five planets here. Hey, what are these planets? Check them out later. Um, I, hold on. Planet list. Uh, Stellaria, I believe, is the one I want. Nope. This UI is impossible to, ah, impossible to use. Up a level, planet list, around, uh, around the black hole. I want to go to Aurelia. All right. And yeah, I don't know what these planets are, but we're going to go here for now. Select. We have enough fuel in our warp drive. So off we go. I hit warp and it consumed fuel, but it didn't take us anywhere. We're still in orbit. Um, I'm going to try putting the artifact in here and see if that does it. Yeah, so I guess the artifact is required. You have to put the artifact in the warp controller in order to warp there. Cool. Uh, I guess if you don't do it, though, it takes your fuel and doesn't do anything. 
Uh, I should have spare fuel on me, I think. Yeah, I have 63 pieces of dilithium left. Which is two warps worth of fuel. And we've made it! Aurelia here, which is the planet down there, orbits a black hole, which I suppose is that thing. The fact that I can see stars in it makes me question uh, how black the black hole is. But whatever. Let's get in our rocket, and I have a matter receiver on me, so when I get to the surface I can teleport there in the future. And I guess it says destination is Aurelia, so let's go. Here's our first look at, a, at Aurelia as we descend. According to my uh, the UI on the left side, I'm almost on the surface, but my Y level says it's at 1000. So I think I have to relog. I remember a similar thing happened when I first went to uh, the other planet, Euclides. All right, we're down on the surface, or at least almost down on the surface. Did the same thing we did on Euclides where there's an invisible rocket floating in the air here. Uh, but I guess it was kind enough to not dump us in the ocean by putting us on a landing float. All right, let's, uh, I guess we'll just put our teleporter here then. As far as black holes go, it's very bright. <laughs> Anyways, um, ooh, that looks like a big oil well. Once I guess what this fluid is, it hurts you when you get in it, and it's very purple. My guess is liquid death. Molten obsidian, huh? All right, well, now I can't put it back. Now I have a bucket of molten obsidian on me. I think this episode has dragged on just about long enough now, so let's wrap things up here. Join me next time as we pillage this alien landscape, loot their dungeons, mine their ores, yada yada yada. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care, bye bye.